Alternatively, rather than making use of fixed secondary resistors switched in and out of the circuit, consider an adjustable external resistor back. This allows an operator to vary the resistance of the rotor circuit in an analog fashion as opposed to digital, full on or full off manner. When the variable resistor bank is set to maximum resistance, the motor operates like a high resistance design D squirrel cage induction motor. In contrast, when the variable resistor bank is set to minimum resistance, the rotor operates like a no resistance design B squirrel cage induction motor. Besides meeting the extreme upper and lower bounds of resistance, the variable resistors also allow other possibilities as well. For example, an operator could set the variable resistor bank to midway and the motor would operate with a mix of design D and B characteristics, a design C if you will. Unlike the bank of fixed starting resistors intended for intermittent operation we discussed previously, if the variable resistors are designed for continuous operation, this configuration, sometimes known as a regulator, also allows a primitive means of speed control. This method was commonly employed prior to the advent of inexpensive motor drives, power electronics devices that vary the excitation frequency unless the operational speed of motors under the direction. You might find this in older installations, necessitating variable speed operation. Consider three generic speed torque plots for three different resistance values. High resistance design D operation suitable for high torque, low speed operations on one end. No resistance design B operation suitable for high speed operations on the other. And medium resistance design C operation, if you will, with a mix of these characteristics in the middle. Consider one value of load torque, let's say right here. In high resistance mode, the rotor turns slowly with a high degree of slip. Given the exact same level of load torque, an operator could decrease rotor resistance to the low resistance mode. Given the same load torque and low resistance mode, the rotor turns faster with less slip. Let's say this is still too slow. Again, given the same load torque, an operator could again decrease rotor resistance to the no resistance mode. Given the same load torque and no resistance mode, the rotor turns faster still with even less slip. Alternatively, one could flip this application on its head and try to keep speed constant given variable torque by varying rotor resistance. In summary, by continuously varying rotor resistance up or down, an operator could get a particular load torque to spin at a desired rotational speed or attempt to maintain speed constant given variable torque. This being said, every time you add rotor resistance, inefficiencies creep into this system. It is for this reason that inexpensive motor drives have largely supplanted this technique, although you might find it still used in occasion. Before we bring this lecture to a close, I'd like to compare and contrast plots of torque, mechanical power, current, real and reactive power, efficiency, and power factor for different levels of rotor resistance. Long story short, you should observe operation almost identical to a squirrel cage induction motor, albeit with a degree of customization. Let's take a look at some experimental data I took from a 200 watt rated wound rotor induction motor in three different operating conditions. No resistance, low resistance, and high resistance. For the no resistance configuration, I simply tie the rotor terminals together like the central node of a Y configuration. For the low resistance configuration, I added 60 ohms to each rotor winding in a Y configuration. And finally, for the high resistance configuration, I added 100 ohms to each rotor winding in a Y configuration. First up, let's compare the speed torque curves for these three different levels of rotor resistance. The no resistance speed torque curve is characteristic of a design B squirrel cage induction motors we might expect. Torque as a function of speed behaves relatively linear near the rate of condition, reaches a maximum torque value, then enters the breakdown region. The high resistance 100 ohm speed torque curve, however, is notably shifted left, characteristic of a design D squirrel cage induction motor, as we might expect. This would be suitable for high torque, low speed applications. Lastly, the low resistance 60 ohm speed torque curve seems to be a mix of the no and high resistance curves, as we might expect. It's important to realize the high resistance rotor mode doesn't magically create more torque. If you squint your eyes just right, no, low, and high resistance configurations are all kind of topping out around 4-ish newton meters. All the high resistance mode does is shift this relatively equal amount of maximum torque towards the low speed side. Additionally, adding resistance to a rotor does have practical limits. Let's now take a look at rotating mechanical power. Given rotating mechanical power is a product of speed and torque divided by a constant, the plots of mechanical power as a function of speed should be explanatory. Not only is the no resistance mechanical power curve favoring the far right hand side of the plot, it's also capable of reaching higher values of mechanical power because the region of higher torque is associated with higher speeds. In contrast, a comparable high resistance mechanical power curve not only favors the left hand low speed side of the plot as we might expect, 
that also isn't capable of reaching nearly the same high levels of mechanical power because that same value of torque is associated with lower speeds. As can be expected, the low resistance configuration straddles the difference between the high and no resistance curves. Let's now take a look at current for these three configurations. As we might expect, each configuration demonstrates the motor draws a small amount of current in the no load condition, which increases the motor energy to rated condition, transitions to overload conditions, and it eventually flatlines. This being said, the high resistance configuration draws less current than the no resistance more, with the low resistance configuration still straddling the difference. This makes perfect sense. A high resistance rotor is known to demand less inrush at start, thus it draws less current. Let's now take a look at real power and efficiency for these three configurations. As we might expect, each configuration consumes a small amount of real electrical power in the no-load configuration, accounting for inefficiencies, and as the motor enters the rated condition, real electrical power consumption increases. When the motor enters overload condition, real electrical power consumption continues to climb, then starts flatlining. Given this behavior of real electrical power and our previous observations of mechanical power, you know each configuration exhibits extremely poor efficiency at the upper and lower ends of operation with efficiency peaking around the rated condition because that's where the motor was designed to operate. This being said, you'll notice the no resistance configuration is more efficient than the low resistance configuration and much, much more efficient than the high resistance configuration. This makes perfect sense because the high resistance designed D rotors, although they do have a reputation for exerting high torque at low speeds and less inrush at start, they're not exactly the most efficient of beasts. Speaking of inefficient operation, you'll note for all three configurations, the overload region, when the motor is consuming high amounts of real power at the same time exerting less and less usable mechanical power output, any electrical power consumed by the motor is going towards self-damage. While it is permissible to temporarily overload a motor, there shouldn't be a regular nor sustained practice unless your goal is to destroy that motor. Lastly, let's take a look at reactive power and power factor for these three configurations. As we might expect, given each motor operates using the principle of induction, there's a draw of positive reactive power, even in the low load condition which gradually increases and eventually flatlines. Given this behavior, each configuration exhibits low power factor and no load conditions since a significant portion of apparent power is being directed towards reactive power. As each configuration moves towards the rated condition and beyond, a larger portion of apparent power is directed towards real power and less towards reactive such that power factor increases. Inside the breakdown region, the ratio of real and reactive power remains relatively constant and power factor kind of flatlines. There you have it, plots of torque, mechanical power output, current, real and reactive power, efficiency, and power factor for the complete operational range of a wound rotor induction motor from locked rotor conditions to the no load speed in three different modes, no resistance, low resistance, and high resistance. You might expect no resistance operation is characteristic of a general purpose design B squirrel cage induction motor, whereas high resistance operation is characteristic of a design D squirrel cage induction motor suitable for high torque, low speed applications. What's great about this is one motor performing these distinctly different roles. In summary, by adjusting rotor resistance, a wound rotor induction motor can meet the needs of a wider range of applications than can a similarly rated squirrel cage induction motor with fixed rotor resistance. Before we bring this lecture to close, I should note that not all wound rotor induction motor manufacturers present data sheets for the complete operational range of the products, and rather than plotting each property as a function of rotational speed, instead, plot each property as a function of mechanical power, limiting themselves to the right-hand side of mechanical power curve from the no load through the rated condition up to maximum mechanical power. So now, because the no resistance configuration allows for expressions of similar torque at higher speeds, whereas the high resistance configuration at lower speeds, the high resistance configuration plots won't cover as much range as the no resistance plots. For this example experiment, I ran using the 200 watt rated wound rotor induction motor demonstrates the no resistance configuration peaked out at an impressive 520 watts, whereas the high resistance configuration peaked out at a still respectable 360 watts. Thus the plots of torque, current, real and reactive power, efficiency and power factor will go from zero to roughly 520 watts for the no resistance configuration and the high resistance configuration will go only from zero to 360 watts. Despite the differences in range, the plots for the no and high resistance configurations exhibit identifiable behavior. As mechanical power output goes up, torque goes up, and speed goes down. You note the slope of the higher resistance rotor configuration, despite the smaller range, is much steeper. Plots of current, 
real and reactive power, efficiency, and power factor for the no and high resistance configuration also exhibit recognizable behavior. As mechanical power goes up, so does current, real electrical power, and power factor. For this limited range, you'll notice that reactive power remains relatively constant, only rising at the very end. As we'd expect, efficiency peaks out at or near the rated condition. I'm encouraging you to pause the lecture and stare at these plots as long as it's necessary for you to confirm your expectations given your previous experience with squirrel cage induction motors. But don't stare at them too long though, because there's more on the way. Until then, that's all I got for you today. In conclusion, this lecture discussed the construction and theory of operation of wound order induction motors, as well as examine the mechanical and electrical properties while in operation. Additionally, we examine how rotor resistance influences the shape of the speed torque curve and mechanical power. Remember to review these concepts as often as you need to really drive it home. Imagine how well lab will go if you know what you're doing. Thank you very much for your attention and interest, and we'll see you again during the next lecture of our series. Remember to tell your lazy lab partner about this resource. Be sure to check out the Big Bad Tech channel for additional resources and updates. Thank you.